thanks for tuning in to our Elroy Palooza featuring James Elroy, as well as Elroy scholars whom I'll introduce in a moment. Great thanks to Chevalier's bookstore where you can get a signed copy of James' new novel, Widespread Panic. I'll show this again in a minute. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th season. When we think of LA crime fiction or just LA fiction, we instantly land on Elroy books that are genre classics, such as LA Confidential or The Black Dahlia, books that come to be definitive of LA itself. LA is much more than a crime, oh, sorry, Elroy is much more than a crime novelist. His portraits of a racist and misogynistic mid-century America are bursting with corrupt authorities, low-life grifters, and one or two innocents with a moral compass pointing somewhere other than South. In his new novel, Widespread Panic, a real life sleazy cop turned tabloid writer named Fred Otash holds all the power here in LA and delights in making life hell for movie stars and personalities like Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Ingrid Bergman, JFK, and so many more. We yes. head from the Beverly Wilshire Pharmacy to parties at, Bever at the Beverly Hills Hotel to Perino's relentlessly towards the next big scoop. It's in LA with a cast of people with flexible scruples. And then in, in the middle of it all is our sleazy cop turned tabloid writer whose days and nights tell us about the beating heart of LA in the 50s, its crimes and its penchant for turning on its own. In the following hour, our Elroy Palooza participants will talk to James about a variety of topics. Elroy scholars, enthusiasts, and Elroy podcast hosts, John Anderson and Grant Nebel will get James to tell us about the book in James' own inimitable way. Award-winning crime fiction writer Zoe Dean will probe James into dishing about celebrities and their relationship to tabloids. And LA social historian Joan Renner will talk about true crime and the real Fred Otash with James. And Elroy Palooza indeed. You will have questions. Please email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com. We'll try to address them. And in the meantime, waste no time in visiting our website to get a link to Chevalier's to get yourself a signed copy of Widespread Panic. He signed a ton of copies, people. Take advantage of that. Thank you. And I'm so delighted to present James Elroy with John Anderson and Grant Nebel. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, after having taken on the institutions that made Los Angeles in the first Los Angeles Quartet, and then gone even further into the creation of American history from the from from Ca Castro's arrival in Cuba to the to the fall of J. Edgar Hoover, James Elroy is now going to Hollywood. And as he said, he's taken a, a real life character, someone who had kind of a walk on part in the earlier novels and given the whole, the whole story, the whole scoop to him. It's his first first person novel in almost 30 years, widespread panic featuring the inimitable Fred Otash. John, you wanna pick it from here? Yeah, um, I'd just like to say that um, again, the thing that makes this book really fascinating is that it is the first time in almost 30 years that we have a uh, first person subjective point of view uh, in an Elroy novel uh, through the entirety of the entire text. What's more interesting though, is that unlike White Jazz, the last book that uh, employed this particular device, this is a book where the language and the prose is of an entirely different, jaunty, hilarious, raunchy and lewd style in an, an inimitable voice that um, we've only seen really on the margins of James Elroy's previous fiction. So without much further ado, I'm hoping I'm wetting everybody's appetite here. We will have uh, James introduce the book, uh, beginning setting the stage in purgatory. James, you got the floor. Hey, I'm coming, motherfuckers, and thank you <laughs> for tuning in tonight. We're going to have a motherfucking blast for the next hour, and we're going to kick it off after John and Grant's groovy introductions with me reading the first mini chapter of Widespread Panic. Dig it. Off the record, on the QT, 
and very hush, hush, dig. Cell 2607, penance penitentiary, reckless wrecker of lives block, in pervert purgatory, 7, 16, 2020. I've spent 28 years in this fucking hellhole. Now, they tell me I can memoir map my misadventures and write my way out. All that religious shit I disdained and disobeyed has played out true. There's heaven for the good folks and hell for the people. Bad. There's purgatory for guys like me, caustic cads that capitalized on a sicko system and caused catastrophe. I've sizzled in my sins for two decades plus. I've relived my earthly life in dystopian detail. And now my cunning keepers are currently dangling a deal. Dig, record your jaundiced journey. Trumpet the truth, triumphant. Hop to heaven and hit that high note. Baby, it's time to confess. Purgatory is shitsville. You're stuck with the body you had on earth when you died. You eat nothing but coach class airplane food. There's no booze, no jazzy intrigue, no Welch or Will women. Violated victims bop by my cell. They remind me of my many misdeeds and jab me in the ass with red hot pokers. Gay gauchos hurtle down from heaven and scold me for outing them back in the homo hate 50s. Yeah, but it was my job. Listen, I entrapped soiled celebrities and putso politicos and uh, 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 cornholed them in confidential. I sold my soul to that maladroit magazine, and now I'm sordidly sorry. Yeah, but so what? Sorry's for limp dick losers. Confession salves the savage self and rips it to righteous redemption. Here, my plaintive plea, oh watchful world, get me the fuck out of here. My keepers have poised me with pen and paper. They've compiled a complete run of confidential. My synapses soar with a million malignant memories. Ready, Otash, 1922 to 1992. I'm a rogue cop, a private eye, a shifty shakedown artist. I'm the demonic deus ex machina of my tattered time and place. I'm the hellhound who held Hollywood captive. I'm the man with the sex scorch secrets you irksome earthlings want to hear. Confidential presaged the infantile internet. Our gobs of gossip were repugnantly real. Today's blowhard bloggers and their tattletales, pussy footing punks all. We stung the studios. We popped the poobahs. We hurled the hurt wholesale. We voyeur vamped America and got her hooked on the shivering shit. We created today's tell-all media culture. We crazily crafted a lurid language and made it our own. It's the lexicon of the lowdown. It's the dialogue of the dish. It's the slithering slur and the thrill of the threat. I think and write an algorithmic alliteration. Language must lambaste and lay on the lash. Language liberates as it offends. 
confidential taught me that. My confession will make this dizzy dialect divide you in two. There is sin and atonement, fuckers. There is nothing else. Purgatory is a punitive proposition. Montgomery Cliff pitchforked me yesterday. Confidential labeled him the Lavender Lilliputian and Princess Tiny Meat. JFK followed Monty. I dumped a dish on his dope habit and his called girl cavalcade. Marilyn Monroe herself penance poked me next. Marilyn was a snout trout. She dispensed head to rogue pharmacists, XXX-clusive, and they dispensed noxious nebutal back. Maybe I shouldn't have tattled the tale, but I was within my First Amendment rights. And now I am consumed with candor and racked with recollection. I'm revitalized and resurgent, and my sugar to march down memory lane begins now. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's going to be a hard encore to beat. <laughs> yeah, but let's try. So I realized, you know, in getting ready for this, James, that I've been reading you for about 25 years now. And one of the pleasures and challenges of this has been um, the journey your style and your subject has taken, that how much you've changed yourself and in your books in these last 25 years. So what I want, first thing I want to ask is, why Fred Otash for you? Why now? Why was this the time to write about him? I came up with three great ideas for stories. They derive from some film work for a long dead TV show, Never Made the Air, featuring Freddie Otash. And I took elements of the three stories and transposed them to novel form. Here they are, Shakedown, the origin story of Fred Otash, Perv Dog, we jump two years from 53 to 55, Fred O's involved with some crumb bum commies, and the overrated and overhyped martyrs, the Hollywood 10, and then the third and concluding story here, which weaves into the overall novel tapestry, that's Shakedown, my inside scoop on overhyped martyr, who was sure as shit guilty, Carol Chessman, the red light rapo bandit of 1948. And of course, the language always has to suit the text. I will find over the years, scandal language to where I believe in widespread panic, it reads artfully, seamlessly, is less obvious, less arch, and more germane to the personal narrator than anything else I've ever done in alliteration. This is the story of Fred Otash, the divided 20th century American man, poised always between, you guessed it, sin and atonement. That was, and I think for people who come to this novel, that's, I think, something you'll see that, as John pointed out, you know, the tabloid language, the alliteration has been in your works before, but this is the first time you've shaped an entire consciousness around it. You know, it's like to create in that way. A lot of, you know, that idea of being poised between sin and atonement, that's a theme that goes through a lot of your characters. You know, and how, how do you think um, Fred Otash's moral journey compares to like some of your other characters, like say, um, like say Dwight Holly in Bloods Are Over? Bloods Are Over, American tabloid, you called 6,000. It's a big tragedy. It's one big tragedy. It's the tragedy of the American 1960s. 
it's deadpan tragedy. Someone, I think it was Ross McDonald said that Dashiell Hammett created deadpan tragedy. And I believe that the hard-boiled arc, the arc of hard-boiled fiction begins with Hammett's first novel, Red Harvest, published in 1929, and ends with my most recent book, Widespread Panic. They are polar opposites in many ways. They are equally inimical, but I am the ne plus ultra of the American hard-boiled novel. I am the greatest living American novelist, and for my money, the greatest American crime novelist who ever lived. And my first licks came from Dashiell Hammett. His is a tragic voice, but I grew up in a way as an artist that the boozed out commie, pouring the pork to Lillian Hellman and numerous other unpleasant women. Nah, I grew up in ways that he never did. So of course, in the end, I have roundly superseded him. Dwight Holly, the whole trilogy, the first quartet, I'm two books into the second quartet. Now, they're tragic books. This is playing hard-boiled language for laughs. Ross McDonald, may he rest in peace, perhaps the last lucid words that he ever wrote before he succumbed to Alzheimer's disease, it was the conclusion to his final trilogy of Archer novels, Archer in Jeopardy, and he writes, in the end, I possess my birthplace and am possessed by its language. That's me, I'm from LA, I was born there in 40, I am possessed by its language, and I'm working for laughs, dark ones to be sure, in this book. And you also that, I remember you used that line as the epigraph for white jazz the last time we spent this much time in someone's consciousness. It seems like a good moment to hand it over to someone I'm really, really fortunate to call a colleague, Zoe Z. Dean, who is uh, just one of the best crime fiction writers ar around out there. Um, and has to be pointed out, she's, you know, she was introduced as an award-winning crime fiction writer. I actually don't think she has written crime fiction yet that has not won an award which is, you know, pretty good record there. So I'll hand it over to her now. Have yeah, for the record, but, but thank you, Grant. And once again. Uh, so, so I wanted to, to start off with sin and atonement, actually. Uh, so Freddie says that everything comes down to sin and atonement, yeah. but when he's in purgatory, he's, he's getting tortured and he's asked to make a confession. So I guess my question is, like, are punishment and confession attached to atonement, does that constitute atonement or does is what Freddie really needs something else? I believe in sin, I believe in original sin, I believe in a punitive system of justice and I believe in atonement. And again, this is a comic novel wherein I give you the thrill and the depravity of sin, I think in equal measure and play them for laughs. But in the end, however tenuously, however momentarily, Freddie Otash is redeemed. Freddie Otash is always looking for one thing and that is, and you know what it is, Love. <laughs> and he finally finds a woman in the noted television of Broadway actress, Lois Nettleton, who he is willing to give his tortured reservoirs of love and from whom he respects love in return. But first, they've got to put psycho, rapo, noxious narcissist, Carol Chessman in the ground. And the state of California, this is no big newsflash, did that on May 2nd, 
1960. And I suspect that John and I were the only two people alive at that point. I had just turned 12 and John would turn 12 in a few months. Sin, atonement, punitive justice, redemption. It's a big, 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 big journal. It's a big, 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 big topic. And it's my personal story and it's my creative story as well. Uh, so kind of going off of that and talking about Freddie's interaction with Carol Chessman and his, his role in Chessman's execution. So he doesn't have the really the same institutional responsibilities as some of your other protagonists and some of the other books. So his role is a little more up in the air. He's more of a free agent. So he right. has kind of way trying out, you know, who do I want to be? Not like, how do I live up to this role? But what role do I have? And he finds kind of I think, several ways of different ways of being the pro dog of the night that have different meanings. So where does he ultimately kind of come down for you? And when is he at his best? He's at his best when he's wondering what things mean for a man who blithely breaks all of God's commandments on a routine daily basis. He's oddly hooked on the whole process of attribution of meaning. He wants to know what it's all about and how does he fit into this grand cosmic scheme as he, you guessed it, looks for love. And if he can't find love, he's out there to get the will your will, woof, woof. <laughs> Many men are like this. There I, I think we're on the subject of, of confession here. It uh, strikes me that when we usually talk about confession, particularly in a literary setting, we think about it in very kind of solemn uh, terms. Uh, the, the morality of literature is usually one that is a path towards redemption. But really, when you look at the 1950s, you often find that in the tabloids, you know, Tattle, Whist Tattler, Whistler, and Confidential, not to mention magazines with a name like True Confessions and so on, that there is a sort of pulp, sort of low culture tradition of confessions as well. And on that note, I'd like to sort of hand this over to Joan Renner and uh, have her talk to you a little bit about growing up in a culture where confession was not always in the realm of the sacred. Joan? Joan, no, hit it. Hey, well, it's true. Uh, confession wasn't always, I mean, like James said, we're probably the only two, we, I know we're the only two people on this panel who were alive when Carol Chessman was executed. And our memories, I think, crack in some of the same ways because of it. And what I'm interested in, James, is because you did know Fred Otash. I read his investigation Hollywood book. Oh my, God. I think there, <laughs> I believe there's more truth in your account than there is in his of his own life. <laughs> and I'm wondering, like, when you talk to him, there's one part of his career when he was a police officer that I find really interesting. Well, a lot of it is, but in 1946, he's still a rookie. And he said he got some information, and that's how he was able to bring in um, Maxie Fields for the murder of, uh, of uh, Benny Meatball Gamson. And I wonder, did he ever talk to you about those days, and what, you know, what, what did he have to say about that? Because you, you can already see that he's starting to work it. You know, he's already finding you know, what he's going to become. Freddie told me a lot of stories. I took them not only with a grain of salt, but in fact with a whole truckload full of salt shakers. I understood at the get that Freddie was a lying, thieving, misanthropic sack of shit. But I needed someone to be the hero of my novel, American Tabloid. And I had decided that it had to be Freddie. So in 89, I flew down to Miami 
where he was living and made him a financial offer and told him, you can do anything you want. And he was making a fortune then appearing on tabloid TV shows like Inside Edition or a couple of others, Inside This, Inside That. So one thing you can't do, you can't contradict the text of this book for attribution. And here's a warning. You're going to be one of the assassins of JFK. Don't worry. The Warren Commission, the feds, the Kennedy family, they're not coming after you. I mm -hmm. got to know Freddie better and saw the depth and breadth of his misanthropy and his duplicitousness. I realized he was going to uh, 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 me up the old dirt road on this promise after he's taken my money and contradict the book on TV. And so I paid him off. I said, I'm not using the book. That's that, you know, go with God, Freddie. And then early, no, it was October of 92. He crapped out and I could have used it for free. Hence, I did use him for free in supporting roles in American tabloid, the cold 6,000 at Bloods are over. Now he's back in all his full fledged, morally complex, deeply spiritual, self pitying fury. Well, I have to say, I like him the best through your eyes, through his own eyes. He's really tough to take. Um, he tells a story, that's for sure, but you can just see reading between the lines, it's not difficult to tell that he is just absolutely full of it. So I enjoy your account of him so much more, but he did have a relationship with, with a lot of these people, like talk about James Dean. And right. he did, like, talk about the Hollywood ranch market days. Yeah. Did you ever go to the ranch market, John? I never did. I grew up in Orange County, so I didn't make it to <laughs> L.A. County that much. Yeah, I went to the Hollywood ranch market a lot. And there was the eye in the sky, two-way mirror up there where the security guys sat. And it was, it was Bob Dylan and John Reshi's Desolation Row. It was open all night. And... I remember it vividly, going to get a hamburger and steal a bottle of cough syrup. <laughs> uh, I'm still bombed. I mean, you want to know where my <laughs> well, RCF cough syrup? I've never come down. That's Likewise. why. Likewise. Yeah. Do you ever take cough syrup, John? Yeah. 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 We have a lot in common. Yeah, we we sure do. I was born in 1948. Yep. I've never been able to tolerate James Dean. And I hate the movie Rebel Without a Cause. I think Nicholas Ray, the director, is full of shit. Uh, a woman journalist told me she knew the whole Salminio story, the story of Salminio's murder very well. And I wrote about it for Vanity Fair. And she told me that in his declining years, the late 70s, Ray was bragging to her about all the underage uh, 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 wolf wolf of both genders that he got during Rebel Without a Cause and that James Dean did the same thing. I didn't like him and I disliked the movie intensely before that and this, this pushed me over the edge. And of course, as always with Elroy stories, I'm not going to tell you what's real and what's not. Um, but I've chosen to believe that Freddie O'Tash and Lois Nettleton are the prime movers behind Carol Chessman's justifiable date with the hot seat in the green room at San Quentin Prison on May 2nd, 1960. Also, I have to tell you, I was very disappointed when... The state of California went to the hot shot, the needle there from the gas chamber, but they retained the green room. They just put a, a long gurney in there to administer the juice because I wanted to buy the green room and put it in my backyard in Carmel and turn it into a doghouse 
for my full story <laughs> on Margaret, but it was not to be. <laughs> Oh, I'm so disappointed that you didn't get to ah, What well, might have been. Man. It's my uh, greatest regret in life. Oh man, I had it all, all planned. I was gonna... It would have been perfect. I can see it. I can yeah. see it. Put a nice little dog bone above like, <laughs> the door there and everything. I would have just been fine. It's food dish, water dish, air conditioned in the summer. Perfect. Heat, winter, a nice poof for Margaret to snooze on and bring her prey, all the neighborhood cats and rats and raccoons. <laughs> are, there, um, are there more Fred Otas stories out there? You see, you're talking about a TV series. Are, are, are there, is, is there more to him? Is he, are we gonna hear more from him? Yeah, he's dead and died in the water way back in 11 and 12. It was just the initial incarnation. And the film and television work that I've done, I did it for one reason, that's for the dough. So all these shit movies that have been made from my books or the couple of screenplays that I wrote, mm. the shit movies are just that, they're shit movies. And I cash the check, but I'm writing a big ass tragic Fred Otash novel right now. The rest of it, it's under wraps. I'll let you know, get closer to the date. Yeah. By the way, this is Elroy the cat. He just was trying to throw him off. Anyway, Zoe, uh, do you have any questions about any other famous uh, personages and their representation uh, in the book? Yes. Uh, so I won't ask what's real, but just one of yeah. the really fun parts of the novel is just that we we get to basically read confidential. You know, we get all of the yeah. sleazy gossip, which still has a great sizzle to it even now. Uh, so I just wanted to ask if there were any stories that especially resonated with you there or that kind of still, you know, appalled you a little bit even now. There's nothing that vibrates my vindaloo, no actual criminal occurrence that vibrates my vindaloo now beyond what I've put together emerging fact and fiction in the new, and all that's under wraps, my lips are sealed, in the upcoming big Freddie O'Tash tragic novel, not told in alliterative jump language. But the big thrill for me in widespread panic was taking the actress Lois Nettleton and making her Freddie's love interest, which along with surprisingly, and she's a, a Kennedy relative, another woman and a fictional woman in this upcoming book of mine. So Nettleton will return the, the Kennedy family factotum and a fictional woman will will perform the romantic function in this upcoming book. Uh, and is, is Freddie's Holly weird? Do you think that's kind of more of the, the truth of Hollywood than we normally get now from most retrospectives? I don't know. It's all, it's blurred for me. It's the, it's the way I see it. And I date this back to the summer of 1959 when I was 11 years old. And my old man kept the books for a topical review called Tantrums of 59. Helen and I tried to find Tantrums of 59 on the internet last night. Helen did in this very same computer. We found the venue, it was the Cabaret Concert Theater in East Hollywood, Silver Lake. It's, it's been the El Cid Flamenco Spanish restaurant for decades now. But my old man hooked up with a great pal of his, the comedian Alan Seuss, who went on to some notoriety in the Laugh-In TV show at this wing ding, and I sat in on perhaps 20 performances during the summer of 59 when I was 11. And I got a feel for low 
bottom, good-natured, mock egalitarian, film biz, movie biz, actors and actress shit. And I met a young couple. Man's name was Wayne Tucker. He was a Juilliard trained baritone. He was married to a good looking woman. She was a dancer. She was in the show. And they had this beautiful Weimaraner dog named Sham, S-H-A-M. And my old man called him a Wehrmacht because he, he didn't like the Germans and he was in the First World War and he didn't like the Krauts and the Nazis, no way. But I sure loved Sham and I used to take him for walks sometimes and peep windows. And so there were all these big hearted, good looking young people. And other than my old man's pal, Alan Seuss, who had a gig on a long running TV show for a while, I don't know what happened to any of them. And like movie biz, TV biz, entertainers in general, when the curtain closes on the final performance, that's it, you never see the motherfuckers again. And that was the case. And it was also the case with Sham, the weird mock dog. I never saw the fucker again. <laughs> and it was rather heartbreaking to me. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of uh, celebrities, making a, a shift into another direction here, I'd like to bring up uh, Lois Nettleton. Who yeah. You've definitely chosen in this book to represent, uh, to really be the moral compass of this book in the more traditional moral compass sense. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of very powerful women in this book, but she really stands out. And I suspect a lot of this has to do with things that you saw her in, you know, in, in 59, 60, when she was doing a lot of really key television. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to have you talk a little bit about that and why she made such a, a big impact uh, in your long-term imagination? I s I've only seen Lois Nettleton in one feature motion picture, A Swinging Stewardess mm -hmm. in Panavision and Color from 1963. Yeah, Helen and I screened it here a couple of months ago. Fly. Yeah, yeah, fly time. Fly with me, come fly, let's fly away. Whoa, 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 whoa. And she was the older, groovy, but disillusioned sister to the, the younger stars of the movie, Pamela Tiffin and Dolores Hart, who of course became a nun. But I saw Lois Nettleton a total of eight times. Four episodes of The Naked City, 61, 2, and 3, and four episodes of The Fugitive. 64, five and six, and she always played the same role. And it is a role that I recast as in my own work as the capital T, capital L, lonely, capital H, haunted, capital W, woman. She was always the lonely, haunted, love star woman. And it was just a crush when I was when I was an adolescent. She was the groovy older woman. She was in reality 21 years older than me. So when I saw her the first time at age 13, she was already 34 years of age. But she is heartbreaking and she is full of fire and she is full of complexity and she is full of unexpressed but simmering below the surface sexual hunger and she is full of rectitude and this was looking back after decades and decades of ponder over the whole big issue of the holy conjunction of men and women i came to see lois nettleton as the voice of the pictorial voice of my own loneliness and sorrow. So how could I not use her having realized this? And how could I not expand on her character in this upcoming book? 
Yeah, because it struck me so much that so much of your writing, beginning with Bloods a Rover onward, is that the, the transformative power of love between men and women has been the dominant theme. And, you know, throughout these books, you have women who actually are the people who sort of put the rails on the reckless lives of, of the men who are in the book. But, and they do so not from simply from standing outside of the male world, but by understanding it, you know, so well and knowing how to operate within it. It's and, the, the world that Helen Cano taught me about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if you've, you've ever heard this. No. Someone said, I was yeah. entirely wrong about Lois Nettleton, who turned out to be one of the greatest actresses with whom I have ever worked. Who I said? regret that you, I regret that you can't see her Blanche, and I regret that we will never see her work in the plays of Edward Albee or Congaree over the Greek tragedies. I think her Medea would send us all rushing to the rivers in fear. Tennessee Williams. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Williams. So. Yeah. And uh, going on a different tack entirely, okay. um, I'd like to talk to Joan about, uh, have Joan talk about Carol Chessman and have you two sort of talk about the 19... <laughs> yes. <laughs> about the summer, about the, about the spring of 1960. <laughs> What are you pointing at, James? You're making... No, no, no. Helen, Helen said, it, and it, this is what I've said, the theme of the first LA Quartet, bad men in love with strong women. Mm -hmm. Always Absolutely. the case. So yeah. I was obsessed with Carol Chessman's case that, that, that year. Uh, I don't know about you. I remember being on the school bus headed to um, Brookhurst Elementary School we stopped for the railroad tracks and I was looking at my watch thinking a man's going to die in a couple of hours. It was a Monday I think, and uh, he's going to die in a couple hours. How, how must that feel to know the, the hour and the time and the date of your death? But I had known something about the case because I've been following it. Were you following that one as well as um, the Finch and Tregoff case? I remember the Finch Tregoff case which was the summer, it was July of 1959. Yeah. It was in Covina in the San Gabriel Valley, which adjoined El Monte, the place where my own mother was murdered the, the preceding year. I remember it was such a big case. Ward Hallinan, the lead investigator in my mother's case, was one of the two investigators along with Ray Hopkinson in the Finch Tregoff case. For folks out there, which is, you know, just about all the world, except for, for John and I, who don't know the story, everybody in this whole sort of affair is very good looking. Mm -hmm. Bernard Finch was a 43-year-old handsome playboy physician who owned a clinic. His wife, the murder victim, Barbara Finch was a good looking blonde in her early 40s as well. There was a groovy looking Swedish nanny and governess, and her name was Lindholm or Lindstrom. She was a groove. And then there was Slinky Carol Tregoff, who was Bernie Finch's lover and her, her Studley Hungwell husband, Greek American driver, Jimmy Papa. And Carol and Bernie got together and they blew the gig six ways from Sunday, bumped off Barbara and got slap on the wrist prison sentences. Yeah. Compared most inept, most inept crime pretty much ever, I think. Even at the time, I was kind of confused by it. But um, I want to get back to Carol Chessman because this, this just completely, the whole thing just obsessed me. And for years, I never thought he was innocent. I was always haunted by, um, by Mary, the victim who was then institutionalized some 20 months later. And I, because I, she was so young and that I never felt that he was innocent. What I, what confused me for a long time was um, the application of Little Lindbergh Law to the case and everything else. But 
when I think about him, and I want, I'm interested in how you think about when I think about him in the context of um, his time and his crimes, I have absolutely no regret that he was put to death. Yeah, yeah, the little Lindbergh case, uh, I mean, the, the Lindbergh kidnapping, the kidnapping for ransom of Charles Lindbergh's little year and a half old baby in uh, 19, early 19, no, 1932, uh, forced the enactment of the little Lindbergh law, which was that kidnapping with bod grievous bodily harm and murder to carry the death penalty. It was very seldom imposed. And it was properly imposed, I believe, in the Carol Chessman case. He fought it off for as long as he could. He always contended his innocence. He was a lying, evil, narcissistic, rapist, sack of shit. And he got what he deserved. Hollywood got behind him, not surprising. Marlon Brando was one of the, another actor I don't like. Uh, <laughs> Williams, you know, liked him a whole lot more than I did during his lifetime. He was there at San Quentin that day saying, I'm going to star in a big budget Carol Chessman flick playing Carol Chessman himself. I wonder if Brando was hoping that he took the gas or would take the gas in a couple of hours so it would make his movie deal that much juicier or if he was actually hoping that Chessman would get off. Well, I think Hollywood had already done that, you know, boo-hoo, I'm innocent stuff with Barbara Graham. Oh, Graham. With yep. that story, with I Want to Live, which yep. is total right. fiction. Right. On the only thing that's true about it is that she died in the gas chamber. Yeah. Apart from that, nothing else about that is true. And they already had their bite at that apple. I think that, um, but I, I, I'm just curious to see, like, how did you, you remember the execution date? Do you remember what was going on in your life? Do you remember any part of that like I do? Yeah, well, I'm six months older than you, so I was 12 and you were still 11. I was at John Burroughs Junior High School, school I love, the only school I ever really learned in. <laughs> and we were watching the clock as 10 a.m. The school B, John Burroughs, was in the Wilshire District in Los Angeles. And we were watching the tick, tick, tick of my math class clock, tick, 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 tick move towards 10 a.m. The teacher was a man named Harry Berlin. He was a man about 43, 44 years of age. And they put the tall kids at the back of the class. I had a view of the, the whole classroom there. And I could see the blackboard and I could see Mr. Berlin sitting on his desk and all the other kids. and. You know, some of the girls had their handkerchiefs out already. They were already pitching the big epic boo-hoo right there. And then Crawford Peak, who was the principal at JB, called Old Man Berlin at about 10.02 or 10.03 and informed him that Carol Chessman had sucked gas. And that was that. And Berlin said something like, well, kids, that's life. And then he paused. He had a dramatic flair. Harry Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> well, kids, that's life or something else. I'm amazed that you were doing the countdown. I mean, I was, I was in my last two months of sixth grade. I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't reached junior high school yet, but nothing like that. And I was acutely aware of it. And I looked around at my other classmates. I remember thinking on that bus, and they just didn't seem to rock that at all. They weren't getting any part of it. They weren't paying any attention to it. And I was completely obsessed with the whole thing. Yeah. That's Orange County for you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can I say? On that note, I think we're going to take some questions. Uh, I'm from LA. Yeah. <laughs> See? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Andrea, I think it's time to bring up some questions from the viewers today. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it took me a second. Um, thank you for that terrific discussion, everybody. Um, remember, we're at 
questions can be sent in to reservations at writersblockpresents.com, although we probably don't have too much time left. We have some great ones now. This comes from a fan of James uh, in the UK. Uh -huh. uh, he, and he asks, given one of the revelations in Perfidia, will we get to read about Dudley Smith's response to the death of Elizabeth Short? No. No, we will not, because there's a factual glitch here. I have Dudley Smith in my very early, early, early second novel, published in 1982, clandestine, as the chief investigator of the case. And then I contradicted that when I finally wrote the Black Dahlia novel years later. So, no, I will never write the words Dudley Smith again. He's out. Okay, poor Dudley. All right, will we um, get to, this is from uh, your same friend in the UK, will we get to read more about Scotty Bennett after the events of Perfidia and before the events of Bloods a Rover? You can tell this guy really knows, <laughs> he really knows his material. Will be in the third novel of the second L.A. Quartet, which I will write after I write the next Freddie O'Flash book. So you, you, the man in the UK, Britain, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, wherever you are, he's coming back, Scotty Bennett. Mm -hmm. um, what made you want to take a break from the second LA Quartet to revisit Freddie O'Tash? It wasn't revisiting Freddie O'Tash. It was that the idea for the book came to me and I realized that I could write it in one third the time that it takes me to write these gigantic 650 page novels and still finish my life's work, which would be one, perhaps two Freddie O'Tash books and conclude the second LA Quartet, at which time folks, I will be, there ain't no other world for it. Old. <laughs> so this is a shorter novel. Um, Widespread Panic is a shorter novel. How like, how did that happen? That it was, you know, because your novels usually are, you know, pretty, pretty thick. I got the idea for the book. I called my editor at Knopf and Vintage, Edward Caston Meyer. I told him the idea. He said, great, write the book. I'll buy it. That was it. Okay. And so it, was it harder writing a shorter book? No. Okay. It wasn't hard because it was half the page count, maybe a little less than half the page count. I'd, I've never been much of a word counter, but yeah. perfidia in this storm are a quarter of a million words a pop. Oh, gosh. How different is Fred Otash from the tabloid guy, Sid Hudgens, in L.A. Confidential? Who's this question coming from? Our friend in the U.K.? No. No, this is somebody else. This is somebody. Okay. Where are you from? Me. It's me. It's <laughs> me. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. Wait, I didn't hear you. What was it? In comedy and tragedy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did you read a lot of tabloids as a kid? No, I read some, but my old man was a Hollywood bottom feeder. He was at one point Rita Hayworth's business manager in the late 40s. In fact, he served to help arrange Hayworth's marriage to the Arab Prince Ali Khan in Paris in 1949 when I was one year old. And my mother was a registered nurse and she wet nursed the booze hound comedian Zazu Pitts. And my old man did income tax work for some film people and I met them. And if Cabaret Concert Theater, 1959, Tantrums of 59, was a baptism in this mock egalitarian 
film biz, art biz, TV biz, music biz world, then some of these dipshit film people come and buy in the early 1950s while I was a tiny rug rat. Uh, that was a, a, a preordination of that. How are the tabloids from the 50s different from the National Enquirer, say, or TMZ? As best as I can figure, the National Enquirer plays on people's fear of disease and death and makes a stab at wholesomeness. Confidential did not play that game whatsoever. It was about demythologizing. It was about undoing the work of the studio publicity system in order to render beautiful film people, groovy swinging socialites and dynamic politicians as sleazy, vulnerable, and yes, sinful, so that Joe and Jane America could pick up this shit rag and <laughs> <laughs> have them. I can have them. They're just like me. <laughs> that, that that is dynamic. And also providential. So, what was the relationship um, then? I think this is. Uh, I'd I'd love to hear you tell readers about the relationship between the LAPD and you know and Freddie Otash in in the book. You know, at the LA, Freddie Otash, the the sleazy confidential writer, the tabloid writer from, you well, know. He wasn't a writer. He wasn't a writer. He verified the stories for Confidential yeah. Magazine. He oversaw with his pal Bernie Spindell, another real life guy, the bugging of bathhouses and the entrapment of various celebrities and numerous celebrities. And Confidential existed and was solvent for as long as it was because everything that they printed was true. So there is a excursion into expose fiction here where in Freddie gets together with the great LAPD chief and groundbreaking law officer, William H. Parker to put down Confidential Magazine. Here's a fun question. Uh, have you ever received any pushback from heirs of some of the celebrities whose names you drop in your books? No, no. They have no legal recourse. Celebrities dead, you use them. If he's not alive, if he's, if he's still alive, you can't. Yeah, I mean, just personal. It's, it's, it's such an interesting, you know, I wonder if you've gotten any mean emails and you don't have emails, so you can't read them. And <laughs> um, when you write about the 40s, 50s, or 60s, is your intent to illuminate a layer of history that we don't often encounter, or do you just want to write a great story that incidentally takes place decades ago? I want to, I want to revise history to my own specifications. I want to create obsession in my readers, my protagonists, my tortured, good looking, dare I say, demonically driven men and women are obsessive. I write obsessively in obsessive language. And I want my obsession with America, my country, and LA, my hometown, to be obsessively rendered in obsessive language. And I want my readers to replicate my obsessive portrayal and my obsessive commitment to the art and craft of fiction by their most assiduous reading of my books. So 
I'm going to follow up on that. You don't have the, you don't use the internet. You, you know, you uh, eschew Google and all that. So um, how do you do, how do you recreate LA? You know, is it, is it, how do you do that? With You make it up. Yeah. It's longstanding obsession and I have a very vivid imagination. It's amazing. Um, this this book, people, you it's it's just so amazing in so many ways. Um, okay, I'm going to ask the final question, and then if anybody else from the panel wants to weigh in afterwards, um, I invite you to do that. Uh, L.A. is a character in its own right in so many of your books. What's your relationship with it now? I don't have a relationship with it. I go there to promote my books. I have friends in Los Angeles, you know, Joan's an old friend, Grant, you know, John, and my, my friend, Glenn Martin, who I dedicated a widespread panic to, along with Lois Nettleton, is a retired LAPD sergeant and for years was the executive director of Los Angeles Police Museum. He's as obsessed with crime with Los Angeles, with Los Angeles crime, as I do. Joan and I and Glenn get together with my frat and Tony, who's the official historian of Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And we will talk over dinner for hours about <laughs> crime in LA. So I come back to do book gigs and to see these people and stay in a groovy hotel. I used to go to the Pacific dining car, but it's not there anymore. It went down during COVID. So it'll probably be the Arroyo Chop House on Arroyo Parkway in Pasadena from here on in. Um, do, do any of the panelists have any, any uh, final questions that you'd like to pop to James while we're here? That you're doing another book may answer this question, but does Freddie make it out of purgatory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Come on, who are we to give up of? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> questions from the from the panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Zoe, do you have any any final thoughts? Uh, no, I was going to ask about Freddie and purgatory, but it's, that's that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I'm glad I'm glad to know that he makes it out. Yeah, he makes it around. It's a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. yeah. Well, I've had enough, and I think I, I, I've asked James enough questions about this book over the last few um, months. So, you know, I know I'm 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 fine. Uh, Joan. No. You're Love good? you, James. Okay. Yeah. Love you. <laughs> that I just like to that I would just like to say that in, in wrapping up that I would love to thank uh, Zoe and Joan for uh, agreeing to be on the panel, my friend and and enabler on this Grant Nabel, for uh, in some respects helping get this whole thing started uh, several years ago when we met James at uh, a Noir City event that Eddie Muller, you know. That's right. Oh my God. Yes. About three, over three years ago now. Still, and, still, still one of the greatest, greatest things we've ever done. Yeah. 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 And also again, thanks uh, Andrea and uh, Writer's Block, Chevalier's Books and uh, Diane Cano for taking care of the sponsorship and the technical aspects. And also Abby Endler for being the kind of middleman between all of the various parties here. And on James's end, Helen Canode and Leslie Werner for handling all of the communications and the technical things from aspects from uh, James's end as well. So we would not have been able to do that. And of course, I'm sure all of our spouses, significant others would, uh, you know, for putting up with this for that this long too. So. Um, kudos to all mentioned uh, before before I take my leave. Does anybody want to ask me why do you write? Or you, or you can all ask. Can you? We can, what, one, or you two, could tell us why you write. Why do you write? <laughs> how do I? Write? What a question, John. <laughs> Came to me out of nowhere. Okay, me out of nowhere. In my craft of sullen art, exercised in the still night, 
when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor by singing light, not for the strut and trade of charms upon the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart do I write on these spindrift pages, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my art or craft. Dylan Thomas. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Chevaliers has signed copies of Widespread Panic. I recommend it. Highly, I thank all of you again, and James, enormous thanks. Be uh, well, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Bye yes. bye. Peace to all. Bye. Oh, 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 oh